So welcome back to the final session of uh, day one. And as I mentioned, we've got, uh, these are 10 minute uh, sessions that we are now embarking upon. Uh, and I'd like to remind you that there are 200 people watching online. So hello to you, wherever it is that you are watching. And also somebody has left uh, a mobile phone uh, hanging about. It's at the reception desk, the radio desk, if you uh, want to come pick it up. Now, the, the people who are watching from home, uh, you don't need to think about that. Unless you've left yours in a drawer somewhere and you can't find it. All right. Altec Chemicals recently announced a significant lithium ion battery anode chemistry breakthrough by its Perth Research and Development Laboratory. And here to provide an update on behalf of Managing Director Iggy Tan is Altec's company secretary, Mr. Shane Volk. Shane, welcome along. Gary? Uh, do we have an Australian saying? company has finally cracked the silicon code and produced lithium ion batteries with 30% high energy capacity. The company has utilized its game changing alumina coating technology that successfully incorporates silicon into the graphite anode of lithium ion batteries. The result is a 30% high energy battery with improved cyclability or battery life. This next generation lithium ion battery technology is destined for the electric vehicle industry. Tesla has announced that the required step change to increase lithium ion battery energy density and reduce cost is more silicon in battery anodes. For this to be achieved, High energy capacity silicon needs to be introduced into anode chemistry. Silicon has 10 times energy capacity compared to graphite. In the words of Elon Musk, this is the most promising anode material. However, metallurgical silicon is unable to be used in commercial lithium ion batteries today due to two major technological barriers. Silicon expands up to 300% in volume during battery operation, causing swelling fracturing and battery failure. The second challenge is that silicon deactivates up to 50% of the lithium ions in a battery. Called first cycle loss, lithium ions are rendered inactive by the silicon, immediately reducing battery performance and life. Industry has been in a race to crack the silicon code. But Australia appears to be at the forefront of the race. This innovative Australian company's game-changing technology delivers alumina-coated silicon particles, which resolves both the swelling and first cycle loss capacity problems. A 30% higher energy capacity battery will mean significant cost benefits to the battery and electric vehicle industry around the world. Phase two of research and development work will see the company strive beyond the 30% energy increase. The company has already commenced a pre-feasibility study for a construction of a 10,000 tonne per annum battery materials plant in Saxony, Germany, to service the burgeoning European lithium ion battery market. And that's the lithium ion battery update. Thank you. So look, as we saw in the video, um, Elon Musk and Tesla uh, are convinced that the step change required uh, to increase uh, battery energy uh, density and battery life is the inclusion of, of silicon in the battery anode uh, as opposed to or in conjunction with the incumbent uh, anode material which is graphite and it's simply a matter of the the energy retention capacity of silicon which is, is almost 10 times that of that of graphite however uh, incorporating silicon into the battery anode has a, has two uh, key problems uh, the first one is when you, you energize or lithiumate the, the silicon, um, it expands up to uh, up to 10, up to 300% uh, or three times, creating a problem, of course, for the battery casing, and also it has a tendency to shatter. So that problem has to be resolved. The other problem is almost 50% of the lithium that reports um, to the silicon um, in the anode um, when it's discharged gets retained in the anode. So that, that problem as well has to be resolved. So this is a problem that uh, we've been working at resolving it at Altec. And, and our, our laboratory here in Kewdale and Perth uh, working on this for 12 months. And what we've been able to do is effectively encapsulate um, the silicon particles in high purity alumina 
And by doing that, we've resolved the expansion problem and we've also uh, resolved the uh, retention problem. Um, so uh, this process, as I said, um, has been tested already. We've, we've tested it with incorporating a 10% silicon into a, into a predominantly graphite anode, and we've seen the 30% increase in uh, energy uh, retention. Uh, in terms of commercialising, uh, the process is quite cheap to do. Um, it's quite simple, and we can put a uniform layer around two nanometers over um, a silicon particle, but we can also adjust the layer uh, in, in size, uh, depending on what the requirement of the application is. Now, just to demonstrate um, a diagram about what happens, it takes uh, four graphite or six graphite um, atoms to contain, uh, take one um, lithium ion, whereas if you um, use a um, silicon, um, silicon, as we'll see in the next slide, one silicon atom can hold um, four, um, I'll just go back, can hold four, uh, here we go, uh, next slide, yeah, so one silicon particle can hold four, um, four lithium atoms, and that's where you get the uh, increase in the um, energy density of, of the material. Now, on a practical sense, um, what does this mean? Um, if you take a Tesla uh, Model 3 car, uh, the standard range uh, with a current silicon-only anode is around 400 uh, odd kilometres. You uh, introduce 10% uh, silicon into the graphite uh, anode and you get uh, a 50% increase, 20% uh, uh, silicon, all of a sudden the range uh, more than doubles. And if you are able to incorporate 30% uh, silicon in, into the graphite anode, then you get range of around you know, 1,200 or nearly three times the, the, the uh, base range of the vehicle. Now, of course, the vehicle manufacturers are unlikely to give you a, a vehicle with a range of 1,200 odd uh, kilometres. What they're more likely to do is reduce the battery size, uh, in, uh, maintain the range around five and 600 kilometres. But what that'll do is reduce the cost of your vehicle and also uh, increase the efficiency um, of the vehicle. Now, talked about commercialisation, uh, where are we up to? We've already commenced a pre-feasibility study. Our German 75% um, owned German subsidiary is doing that. We're looking at uh, constructing a 10,000 uh, tonne per annum coating plant in uh, eastern Germany, in, in, in Saxony. And already we've secured a 14 acre uh, plot of that land there. And we have uh, signed um, some NDAs with some European uh, vehicle manufacturers. But first things first, a pilot plant. Um, we announced this morning that we've um, appointed the engineering group to uh, APC contractor for that plant, and that'll be constructed through, through this year. And we should be producing material by the end of the year and making it available uh, for testing. We've got two bays, uh, two big bays in the uh, Dock 3 facility, which is at the industrial park. Um, as I said, the design's complete and we'll be able to produce about 120 kilos of material uh, per day and send that out to auto and, and battery manufacturers uh, to test. Um, that's just an image of the Dock 3 facility. It's a fantastic new facility in a repurposed industrial park in Eastern Germany. Um, the official opening ceremony was completed in, in January for our takeover of that facility. Um, quite significant uh, media coverage in the area, um, really trying to grow or regrow industry in, in this part of Germany. Um, and that's just the relationship between the 14, uh, where the 14 hectare plot of land sits um, compared to the pilot plant site. It's only a few hundred metres um, away. That's the product. So we've launched the product. We've registered the trademark. It's Salumina Anodes. We've also uh, registered or patented the uh, production process to produce this material. Um, feedstock supply is important. Europe um, has probably um, been widely publicised. It's trying to decouple itself as much as it can from Asia in terms of raw products uh, supply. The supply chains are coming home, coming local. So we've partnered with a fabulous um, carbon uh, supplier, SGL in Europe, and also an internationally renowned uh, silicon provider, um, Ferroglobe. And, and that's, uh, we'll be working with them to supply both the pilot plant and if the feasibility study gets up into the full scale plant. So Europe is really where it's at in terms of uh, the growth of lithium-ion batteries, the growth of electric vehicles, and that's why we've positioned ourselves in, in Eastern Germany. Um, look, for those of you that don't know, all the European uh, car manufacturers have announced that they'll be transitioning to um, electric vehicles 
Each of them will only be producing electric vehicles by 2040. Um, the early movers are Jaguar and Volkswagen um, with the others uh, to follow. So the European market is tremendous uh, in terms of uh, alumina, in terms of uh, battery materials. And this is what the graphite demand curve looks like going forward in Europe, uh, spurned predominantly by the auto industry. Now, our silica, silicon anode material will displace, of course, some of that graphite, but the market is growing um, so quickly and, and so fast that there's more than enough room to take the silicon material that we'll be producing. And just to give you an idea of scale, uh, this is the number of battery plants that have been announced in Europe. Uh, some have just come on stream and others are coming on. And of course, the centre of that activity is Germany. Um, so that's why we're there. So look, um, a fabulous opportunity for Altec Chemicals. Uh, Salumina, we believe, is, is a product and we're working as hard and as fast as we can to, uh, to commercialise that product. So please follow us. Any questions, we're here on the booth, please pop, pop past and say hello. Thank you. Codrus Minerals is a gold explorer with projects across WA and in America. Uh, that are heavily, heavily underexplored. They are well funded and heavily leveraged to exploration success. We welcome Shannon Bamford, their managing director. Shannon. Thank you. Usual disclaimers to be read at your own pleasure. Okay, Codrus Minerals, we listed last year at the end of June, and in seven months, we've been able to get exploration moving forward on each of the four projects that we hold within the company. Three of the projects are in Western Australia, two in the Kalgoorlie district, one up in Nullagon in the Pilbara, and then the fourth project is over in Oregon in the Western USA. All projects in Australia are close to existing operating assets, making the pathway to monetize them far quicker than if they were out in much further afield areas. We're strong, strongly supported uh, with a cash balance of $6 million, an attractive capital structure with Blackstone Minerals sitting in at about 46%. So the first project that we'll get into is Redgate. Redgate is 140 kilometres north of Kalgoorlie in an area that received a little bit of exploration and mining in the 80s and was then largely forgotten about through the 90s and 2000s. That started to change when Saracen, now Northern Star, started working around the old porphyry mine. Porphyry was mined in the 80s as an oxide pit. It's now produced or have resources and reserves up to and including a million ounces. Uh, recently, Nexus Minerals has been getting some great results just to the southeast of Porphyry. And we've been up working on our ground uh, directly to the north. Our maiden drilling for Redgate was returned recently. And what we got to see there was some really wonderful numbers come through. Um, highlight being 23 metres at 3.8 from 14 metres downhole, including 15 metres, sorry, five metres at just under 15 grams a tonne. So from an exploration in a, a greenfields area, this is really exciting stuff. The program was only 3,000 metres and was spread over four different prospects. Uh, two of them come back with good mineralisation. So really, really encouraging. We're working on having very good systematic build up right the way through our exploration process on each of our projects and it's no different to Redgate. So we'll be going in here and doing a little bit of follow-up drone magnetic survey work to try and really help us underpin the geology. When we start to look at the intercepts, we can see that there was a little bit of historic drilling in the very north at Porphyry North, and at Porphyry West there was sporadic shallow drilling, and we've gone in and drilled holes uh, up to the order of 200 metres. In there, we can see that we're seeing mineralization located on the granite contact in the pink and the very foot wall of that granite contact is where we're seeing the mineralization, which is really interesting when we look at some of the additional exploration that we've done, where we've received gold mineralization, yet with the rig capacity that we had, we weren't able to achieve penetrating into that lower contact. Okay, we've got a little jam. There we go. And so when we step to the cross section on the left of screen, we're about 80 metres north of where we had the, uh, the high grade mineralisation. We didn't get through to that lower contact where we'd be expecting the higher grade mineralisation, but we still picked out 16 metres at three. And quite interestingly, up in the Mafix, one metre at 21 grams a tonne. 
Um, it's early days, but we're looking at this through the lens that we're looking at a fairly good mineralizing system that is able to push mineralized fluids out into the matrix and not just into the broken uh, contact areas, which is far easier to host mineralization. The MADEM program with this success will obviously be followed up with further drilling. We're still waiting for about 40% of our assays to be returned. As I'm sure you're all aware from numerous presentations today and talking to people in the, the booths that assay turnaround in the industry at the moment is tortuously slow, uh, but we work with what we have. At Middle Creek, we're up in the Nullagine area up in the Pilbara, an area that has been mined sporadically on and off for over 60 years. Some of the better known deposits up there are the blue spec mine that was mined for just under 300,000 ounces at about 16 grams a tonne. And then the Golden Eagle Mining Center that was previously run by Millennium and is now owned by Novo Gold where they're processing ore from their Beaton's Creek operations. Luckily for us, over the last couple of decades, exploration in this district has been a little bit myopic. It was always have to be on either the Northern Blue Spec Fault, the Southern Middle Creek Fault, and look for arsenic anomalism and step off from there to look for gold. So what we have is a very well endowed mineralized district and all of our tenure has zero drilling. There's not a drill hole in there. Uh, we pegged all of these licenses and then set about doing some soil sampling. And with the soil sampling, we quickly come about to find a number of well mineralized trends. We did some rock chip sampling and we're seeing multiple areas through the district returning plus one gram rock chips. So it's an area that is extremely underexplored. We're in there at the current time and we wanna be able to try and give these soils some geological context. So we're out there with an excavator at the current time, excavating some trenches around these soil anomalies so we can do some mapping, do some further sampling and actually draw with genuine intent uh, later in the year. So Middle Creek, it's a wonderful target. It's very early days for it and we're moving it forward. Silver Swan South, that was the first project that we went to post listing and drilled a number of diamond holes down at Black Hawk, Black Falcon and Black Eagle and one at Venus. These holes were really good in telling us that we had the right geology if we want to look further south in the gold to Canana Bell and in some of the ultra mafix, um, similar style to what you'd be looking for for nickel mineralization. What we didn't see in that drilling was the gold. So we've been going through and really doing a solid review, making sure that we understand the geological context of the drilling that we did and the opportunities that are in front of us. Uh, we've identified that up in our Northeast and our no Northwest, uh, we do have some really great opportunities here. Um, and we're going to go in there with drone magnetic surveying at the end of the month uh, to try and help fill in that geological picture and a targeting of drilling. So we'll be drilling back in there before mid year. And now for something that's very different to a lot of what you would have heard today. Uh, the Bull Run project is in Eastern Oregon, right over on the border with Idaho. And what a lot of people forget is when we think of gold rushes, we think of Australia and we talk about towns of Kalgoorlie, Coolgardie, Bendigo, Ballarat, Hill End. When you go into Western America, you're talking about Sumter, Cracker Creek, areas that had wonderful endowments of alluvial gold. And the alluvials were mined by the old timers through from the 1860s through to the early 1900s, uh, where they quickly started to run dry. That forced the, the miners to start working up the sides of the hills to find out the provenance of the gold. They started to find outcrops with gold sitting in outcrop, visible gold, and started to just mine these narrow little quartz veins into the side of, sides of the mountains. And that's essentially what we have at Bull Run. Uh, it's an area where there's been historic small scale artisanal mining for over 100 years. Uh, the current owners of 12 of the mineral claims that we have an option agreement over, they go in there and mine a plus ounce um, quartz vein a couple of times a year, take a couple of cuts from underground. Uh, but it's really nice, fun artisanal mining. We're there and we've pegged another 90 mineral claims around that option agreement. So we've got a really good land holding in this part of the world. And we think there are some, some tremendous opportunities. The last operator of any scale that went in there to do some exploration was Newmont um, in the 80s. They drilled 20 meters at just over four grams a ton from surface. Uh, but in the 80s for Newmont, that wasn't dice. In 2022, it's a totally different scenario. 
Uh, recently, we've just added an additional 12 claims on areas where we could see the trend in the soils running. We did the soil sampling, immediately picked up another anomalous zone at Koski. Uh, we're going to commence over here, um, very near into the, this year. We'll get the snow to melt. We'll resume doing our IP survey. We started at the back end of last year, but snow postponed us. Uh, we get drone magnetics planned. We'll be kicking that off in the next couple of weeks as well. And then doing a little bit of mapping and sampling on the field while we use a dedicated company to help us with our um, permitting uh, with the Oregon departments that we need to liaise with. So very interestingly, every project that we've got has a work program and we're working across all four projects to try and expedite exploration success. So shares on issue, very simple, 75 million shares on issue, $6 million cash in the bank and an enterprise value of four and a half, which is way below market. So where do we sit? We're highly leveraged to exploration success. We've got a well-credentialed man management team that has been there and done it before, from exploration through to building mines and operating mines. We've got an attractive capital structure, and I would urge you to have a very good look at our business, and I think it's a wonderful chance to invest. Thank you very much for your time. Hillgrove Resources Chief Geologist and Exploration Manager, Peter Rolly, has over 40 years experience in Australia and overseas with a variety of companies, both large and small, in regional and brownfields exploration, mine geology, resource estimation and optimization, and managing up and down. Peter, your 10 minute slot begins now. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming along this afternoon. I don't know if you know about Hillgrove, it's um, a copper explorer. It's been a developer, a miner, and we're about to recommence. There's not many of those uh, copper companies around. We all hear the copper story. We're a little bit different to a lot of the other companies here. We've already got a plant. It's been processing and operating and working and it's fully de-risked therefore. No cost uh, risks with respect to construction uh, estimates, with respect to build programs. We have a decline in progress already. It's already being de-risked the underground. We have permits for mining, they're all granted. There's no risk. We're on scheme water, scheme power, local labor hire, we're only 50 Ks out of Adelaide. No risk to the supply of expertise or labor. We have a growth pipeline to continue. So how much is a de-risked operation worth in today's highly volatile uh, in both commodity prices and in our inflation? And we are firmly on track to be producing our first copper ore this year. So let's have a look at the story. Short 10 minutes, so go home and do your homework, please. The company overview, you can read about it. What I'd like to just point out is that we are uh, fairly close to Adelaide, as I've mentioned, and the reason that uh, we are able to uh, get drill rigs within weeks. People can be home every night and still work at a very high paying uh, operation and place. We have people constantly contact us. Is there any opportunity to come and work in the Adelaide Hills? It's a nice place to be. As I've already mentioned, uh, it's a fully permitted copper gold project uh, with a great story behind it. I'm a geologist, so you've got to hear some geology. The project has been was worked for eight, eight years as a series of open pits, and then uh, took a hiatus while we did the drilling for the down depth extensions. Some of those drill results are on the slide here. Depending what cutoff grade that you want to report those at, they can either read as 23 metres of 2.5% copper, 0.2 gold, 14 metres, 2.1 copper, 0.1 gold, 20 metres, 2.1 copper, 0.7 gold. Or if you expand the cutoff grade and look at a larger operation, you get 171 metres of a percent copper, 166 metres of 0.9% copper. It's a multiple load system, depending how you want to go about mining it or what your copper price happens to be. The geology is essentially de-risked. We have been mining it. We know where it goes. We drill holes up to 800 metres below surface. It's a structurally controlled uh, copper gold system. We hit those uh, iron sulphide uh, alteration targets within five or 10 metres of where we project them to be. The geology is essentially de-risked. Over the past couple of years, we've undertaken the drilling. We've estimated a new resource using the same or similar estimation process that we used in the open pit. 
we were able to estimate the open pit resources to within a couple of percent by end of mine life. We know that that estimation process works. Currently, we have about 62,000 tonnes of copper metal in our current resource, uh, which is an 80% increase on last year's, and we're still drilling. Only two of the nine copper deposits that we have there have been on our mining lease have been drilled so far. Another a more detailed view of the breakdown in the resources and the intersections that we have. Infrastructure, the mill, to, the mill is already built. There's no risk. We don't need to be conservative about metallurgical test work. We don't need to wonder about the product that we're producing, the recovery through the plant or its costs. When the mill was fully operational through with the open pit, our total uh, ROM pad costs, mill processing costs, float costs, concentrate costs, tailings costs were around seven bucks 80 a tonne. It gives us a lot of flexibility in mining underground to a very effective optimized cutoff grade. Here's a quick video showing, first of all, the open pit that's been completed with the haul road down the side now being a decline down to 360 metres already in place. Uh, the processing plant uh, is kept in fully alive operations, not just on uh, care and maintenance, uh, it's energised every week to make sure that there are no hiccups for when we recommence production later this year. All sorts of mill pitches that you can look at while we're going through uh this particular short video it puts us in a very different space so so many of the explorers that are out there to those who have to generate a major resource base to be able to provide the funding or obtain the funding uh, in the future in this current uh, space of uncertainty we don't have those risks at the end of last year we released to the stock exchange an economic assessment study and the metrics here for you to see that it, uh, the first stage is stage one uh, for the first three years underneath uh, the, the open pit that you saw in a previous slide, post-tax free cash position uh, in that is estimated around $196 million. It's a really useful prize to go chase at the earliest opportunity without waiting for the risks and the uncertainty in the marketplace. Payback after 14 months. So um, uh, again, to reiterate, we're in a very different position to so many of the other explorers out there that are trying to finish the drilling, the fee studies, what will the prices be in the future? We're going to be producing later this year. We believe we are very undervalued because we have de-risked so much of our, our future operations. The timeline that you can see there uh, uh, with respect to all production. A quick, uh, again, video speaking to the open pit. You can see the open pit there, the decline, uh, which is the hall road down to the base of the pit. Uh, we've started the decline here with a, an electric continuous miner in yellow here, put together by Komatsu Research and Development Project. Because we're only 50 k's from Adelaide, we, Adelaide, we can provide access uh, for this type of technology to be to be trialled uh, for people to come and observe the uh, benefit of it uh, and to continuously improve this research and development project. What it's meant is that we've been able to complete this portion of the portal and now about 30 metres of the decline, uh, uh, basically at zero net cost to Hillgrove. What a great exploration exercise to take advantage of whilst we complete the drilling and finalise the feasibility study. The decline has already commenced. The growth aspects of where we're going is Hillgrove. We have um, uh, the centre in the black square there is where the stage one uh, three-year project is uh, commencing this year. And then in addition, we've got another seven uh, targets sitting in that mine lease around. Some of those have been mined in the open pit. So we know their geology, we know how they work and uh, they'll be the next uh, growth stages of the uh, open pit. In, um, in long section, therefore, you can see that not all those projects have been drilled to depth. We're very much focused on getting going because all the infrastructure is already built. We need to make it return now. So that's the, the pink area that you see in the center of that slide. The orange area is the next uh, drill area in the green and the blue and so on, as we sequentially uh, drill out these projects over the next couple of years to be able to bring them then into production, not sequentially, but in parallel to optimize our mill uh, uh, costs. When we look at in particular, the Southern end, we call it the South Hub. In the South Hub area, there was a couple of open pits there that we've mined with some outstanding drill intercepts. Uh, you know, 17 metres of three and a half percent copper, 0.6 gold, 14 metres of 2.8 copper, 0.3 gold. 
those pits at this stage have not been drilled underneath and they will be our growth project going forward once we've commenced mining from the uh, open pit in the centre. So we believe that we are a totally undervalued investment. And I guess you hear that a lot, but the plant is already built. The decline has already started. The geology is already well known. The first three years, according to the economic assessment study, is forecasting $196 million tax-free profit for us, net cash flow, for us to drive us forward. So we would invite you to really jump on board and be part of the copper project that's starting this year. Thank you. <coughs> Beacon Minerals is a West Australian gold producer that is profitable, dividend paying and retaining cash for growth and acquisition. To tell us more, we welcome Managing Director Graham McGarry. Welcome, Graham. Uh, thanks to Gavin Wirtz for getting us on board and to RIU for allowing us to present. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, standard disclaimer, uh, corporate snapshot, our, our share price and our capitalisation is $120 million, net enterprise value of 105 after the cash, very minor amount of debt. Uh, we uh, have in Western, we really are a West Australian company, 55% of our shareholder numbers are West Australians, they hold 67% of the shares. Directors and employees uh, have 21% of the company. The company has strong management on site, led by Darren Gaby, Zane Padman, and Rennie Leo. Uh, obviously, there's concerns in the mining industry about staffing. It's not easy. COVID-19 has added another dimension, but we, uh, we have been able to manage through that so far. Community involvement. We have a community involvement. We, we allocate money each quarter to Coolgardie and Kalgoorlie. We're closest to Coolgardie. Uh, so we, we contribute money to uh, various charities. We are now uh, looking at our carbon footprint, uh, solar power and batteries with Kalgoorlie Power Systems, who are well, well represented in Kalgoorlie uh, and do a great job for our project. Drilling out ore bodies or finding ore bodies is always exciting. And uh, in January 2017, we were alerted to this project. We started drilling on the 4th of January. We signed the agreement in late December, started drilling on the 4th of January. We had difficulty with the first rig with the clays. Uh, we were able to quickly exchange it for another rig with more air and thinner rods. And quickly we were able to drill a lot of metres per day, through over 300 metres per day. Assay turnaround was quite quick. And uh, in those days, it was quite quick. And we quickly got to a maiden mineral resource by March 2017. And you can see the timeline right through there. We uh, raised money through debentures and we were quickly able into production by September 2019. And when we get forward to this date at the moment, we've gone through our second tonne of gold. We paid out $29.5 million in dividends. And we are reviewing our dividend announcement for April this year. Uh, the dividend, last dividend last year was fully frank. And the, if, if the board decide to announce a dividend this year, a final, final dividend, sorry, an interim dividend, that will also be fully frank. We've got a proven track record. Uh, we've delivered on the pre-feasibility study. Uh, targets met or, or exceeded throughout the project. And I'll talk a little bit about the mill thro throughput. But the project is, has been quite successful to date for shareholders. The calendar year 2021 performance. Uh, if you focus on the oil milled column, you'll see a st steady increase in the oil milled from 145,000 tonnes a quarter up to the latest quarter, which is 215,000 tonnes or in excess of 800,000 tonnes per annum, which is 60% above the pre-feasibility study. People thought that we couldn't process this high clay content ore, and uh, Jeff Grenell uh, felt that he could, and he designed the plant accordingly. And to have the plant operating at 60% above design is quite an achievement. The average gold sales price, you'll see a column there, uh, and in this last quarter, 2455, which is close to the highest of any producer, we're un unhedged. 
previous quarter were unhedged in 2443. Uh, if you'd like to project into this March quarter, we sold gold last Friday a little bit early for 2650 at uh, 2555, and today it's 2635. Our cash costs are relatively low, but we also do build stocks. And in this quarter, just gone, we drew down uh, a lot from our stockpiles uh, whilst we built our tailing stand. So the full year 2021 highlights is historic, but uh, we, we've uh, achieved quite a bit. Uh, we've increased our resources and reserves, and I'll speak about that in a moment. Uh, one of the principal items is panel four. You'll see this panel four there, and you'll see that uh, waste from here is going across and building the outer wall of this new tailing stand. And some of the clays have been suitable to build the inner wall, and we're also winning uh, clays from within the pit there to build the inner wall and comply with the uh, guidelines laid out by the DMIRS. So 74% of the waste is from panel four is going into, into that tiling stem. The mine life has been increased. Uh, we've added two and a half years uh, through the acquisition of McPherson's reward. We're currently doing a mine life update and uh, we expect to release that in April 22, obviously. And uh, that will be done at an increased throughput. And we'll be looking at blending McPherson's reward hard quartz ore with clays, one from panel three, uh, which is, has a higher clay content than panel four. So the Geordie uh, processing plant, we've now got tails capacity for seven and a half years. Uh, so that's quite a life, and that, uh, that's when we complete the existing dam and when we mine panels four and panel three. So long life for tailings. Water availability is very good. It's, it's quite a unique paleo channel. The water starts, uh, we draw water from about three kilometres north of panel four out to three or four kilometres east of panel three. Uh, water's good quality, uh, helps us with our... our uh, reagent consumption, particularly lime. So we're very happy with that. The increasing throughput I spoke about earlier on, we're, we believe that we will get up around 750,000 tonne this year, uh, 750 to 850. So we were running at 850 in December 21. So the plant is quite successful. Quite a unique ore, didn't need a, a gravity circuit. In fact, if we ran the gravity circuit on the ore and I think we recovered two ounces in 24 hours. So it just wasn't worth running the gravity circuit. It is installed there now. It gives us a lot of flexibility going forward for different ore types. Um, virtually all the gold plants in, in, in and around the Gulf has got gravity circuits. So this one's got one, it's a standard uh, type Nelson Acacia arrangement. And we will start using that on the 1st of March when we process panthrol. At Lost Dog, I've just explained that uh, panel four we're currently mining over here. When that is finished, we move to panel three. This has got a higher clay content as did uh, panel one, that they were higher in clay, panel two a bit less, and panel four a bit higher in silcrete and lower in clay. The clay does cause problems. Uh, it, it, it causes problems not only when you're mining, and we've had to use articulated trucks as we get towards the bottom end of the paleo channel, it gets quite boggy and there's obviously water there. So when we go to McPherson's, we'll change our strategy and um, uh, use uh, rigid trucks. Panels free, uh, grade control drilling starts shortly, and uh, we, we believe that'll just confirm the reserves that we've currently got, which is just under 800,000 tonnes. We effected a native title agreement there with the group that is uh, almost certainly the successful native title claimant for the area. And that's been done and dusted. And now we're just waiting for final approval to, to mine panel three. The mine base case, I spoke about using articulated trucks in the wet and boggy conditions, but at McPherson's and Tyco will move to a hundred ton rigid trucks. Uh, Black Cat South has been pushed out. We do have to uh, realign the road up there. Uh, only a minor realignment, it won't be a problem, but we'll do that later. So mining at Black Cat South won't take place for a while. 
the previous life of mine uh, contained 50% clay and 50% hard material, so that drove the blending uh, issues or the issues we had to address. Uh, and we will obviously look to, uh, at the moment, running probably about 80% silkrete and 20% clay, and we're getting higher throughputs. The life of mine schedule will be uh, announced in April 2022. It will be compressed from six years, uh, that's for sure. Um, so that is a challenge for us to obviously secure more ore reserves. Our resources have been increased 100% and our reserves have been increased 53%. So we've extended the life of the mine uh, out quite a bit from the original, uh, uh, the original resource and reserve we had. Exploration, uh, we are, we're not cattle farmers. We don't hold big uh, lots of ground, but we have done 6,000 metres of RC and 32,000 metres of air core. Queenslander at McPherson's is our first uh, drill target down at McPherson's outside the ore reserves at McPherson's and Tyco. Exploration at Big Cat and Link South are the two other targets. We will continue with exploration later this year. I've just got my buzzer, so I'll have to wrap up very quickly. Also at McPherson's, uh, we have the nickel prospects there, there that they will take quite a bit of working up to get to a, to a target where we can drill, but that will be done. We're looking to build a 10 year mine life. Uh, we want to get to 50,000 ounces a year and be a meaningful producer. Um, we also want to be recognized as a company that deal, delivers with integrity and uh, particularly amongst our local community. Why invest in Beacon Minerals? Uh, it has a strong skin in the game from the directors. We have a 100% owned mill. We have a strong cash position. We have a track record of paying dividends and we're retaining cash for growth and acquisitions. Uh, so that is, uh, we believe that's a strong reason to invest in Beacon Minerals. We have established a physical presence in time or less. We were alerted to prospects here in 2008. We visited there in 2016. There was a mineral code put forward in 2013, another one in 2016. Then the late uh, middle, the third quarter of last year, the mineral code finally went through, through parliament. So we've applied for eight areas up there with no guarantee of any success. So we'll get any or all of them. Thank you for your time. Unfortunately, Dr. Mike Jones from Impact Minerals can't be with us, so we're going to move along to S2, S2 Resources Limited, where Matthew Keane is Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks very much, Jerry. Thanks, everyone, for uh, staying in the auditorium this deep into the afternoon. Uh, Ten minute uh, time slot, so I'll, I'll move through quite briefly. briefly. Disclaimers. Uh, for those who don't know S2, S2 is a, a greenfields exploration company. So focusing on areas of uh, uh, new, new wealth generation um, and high prospectivity. Um, S2 was a spin out of Sirius Resources. So Sirius was the discoverer of the Nova Bollinger uh, nickel copper cobalt deposit in the Fraser Range here in Western Australia led to a, a $1.3 billion takeover by IGO Limited. Uh, the key elements of the company, look, we've got a team who have made multiple discoveries. So beyond their Nova Bollinger discovery, um, other discoveries in the team include Thunderbox, as well as a number of nickel deposits. Overall, six deposits have been discovered by this team, which have gone on to become mines. Uh, the other thing you need, of course, for explorers need good ground. We've got that uh, in spades, which I'll, I'll get to very shortly. Um, and of course, you need funding to do what you need to do. We've currently got uh, 8 million thereabouts in the bank. Uh, as well as a, a $4.5 million shareholding uh, in Todd River Resources. Okay, I won't dwell on our capital structure, just to say we've got uh, around about 556 shares on issue. Um, and our, our shareholding, uh, shareholders, sorry, um, is somewhat more institutionalized than expect for what I'd classify as a pre-discovery company. Uh, we're roughly 30 to 40% institutional investors. And a lot of these shareholders are backing us, not particularly for any one asset, but backing a team that has a history of making discovery. Hopefully we can uh, deliver that for them and do that again in the nearer term. Okay, I'll try and get the laser to work here, but uh, look, we've got, we've got exposure to a number of uh, very high profile provinces in terms of exploration. Um, first of all, in Finland, uh, 
we're exposed to the central Lapland greenstone belt. So this is an area that has tier one deposits in nickel and copper uh, based metals, as well as gold. Uh, it's also been a, a, a rather a, a front uh, a frontier for Canadian companies over the last few years. The number of discoveries in courting, including a, a discovery by a junior called Rupert Resources, where they've come up with a maiden four million ounce discovery just last year. Uh, we're exposed to the Western Yule Gun, of course, uh, Chalice have made this famous in recent history um, with a number of project areas. Uh, we've got exposure to the Murchison Goldfields for the Jillawarra project. Uh, we've uh, got our Coonabury project, which is an analogue to the Fraser Range, where these guys made the Nova Bollinger discovery. That's over in northern New South Wales. And more recently, and perhaps uh, is now our flagship and the most exciting part of the, uh, the company, is... Uh, a greater foster fuel project in Victoria, in the, uh, in the Victorian goldfields. I'll get to that as our first project. So we were part of a tender process, quite, uh, quite well publicised and very well, uh, uh, I suppose, competed by you know, anecdotally up to 30 companies, including a lot of the major gold uh, producers globally. Uh, we were successful and uh, I would say we've won the best block of the four blocks on offer. Uh, the reason for that, it is the block that abuts and surrounds the Fosterville Mine. So Fosterville Mine, uh, owned by Kirkland Lake, who have recently merged with Agnico. Um, that's now merged co of a $26 billion Canadian company. So we have the exploration tenure that surrounds that. Uh, with this ground come, comes a lot of data um, to, our, to S2 resources. Um, we've got a great wealth of geochemical data, geophysical data, um, including gravity, IP, EM, um, all of that's laid out for us. So uh, I suppose we're not accustomed to walking in a project where we're not doing the, the greenfields uh, work, the, the air core, the EM, um, the, the, the GFS that goes with that. Uh, we've effectively had that done for us. So we're at the stage now, we've got projects which are ready for diamond drilling. Uh, I will note that this is an exploration application license. So the process here, uh, we're currently going through the native title negotiation, or well, that's the next step in our process ahead of the exploration license grant. Uh, I'll just pause briefly on this slide. Uh, I'm focused on the pictures here. Effectively on the right-hand side, as you look at that, the Fosterville mine sits in the centre. Um, more recently, so Fosterville mine was uh, roughly produced about 120,000 ounces per annum before the discovery of the Swan Zone at depth. Uh, this transformed this mine into a, a plus 600,000 ounce uh, producer per annum. Uh, on the basis of grade alone, not additional tons. Um, so these deposits uh, increase in grade at depth. Uh, more recently, Kirkland Lake have been drilling out the Corey Zone, the Robins Hill Corey Zone, and that looks to be on a parallel structure to the north, uh, and it looks to be very similar in plunge extent and direction and position of the main faults to the uh, to the main Fosterville mine. We're fortuitous to have just over the the tenement boundary, Gornong South. Uh, which is another parallel structure to the north, uh, has a historic existing resource, which I won't quote, but his drilling by Kirkland Lake prior to their relinquishment of this tenement, which uh, wasn't at their, I suppose, at their favour, uh, prior to going into moratorium, uh, they drilled a couple of deep holes and proved that this shallow mineralisation at surface did have a plunge extent, and that again is, is on our ground. The other thing I'd point out is, this is, a, this is a, a gold manifestation, which is a product of structures intercepting uh, folded turbidite stratigraphy. So it's a stratigraphy versus, versus structure play. Both the stratigraphy and the structures propagate both north and south into S2's tenure. So beyond those which directly abut the mining license, we've got a number of uh, both uh, historic gold deposits as well as anomalies. Uh, right throughout the block. So we've got a lot to go on with here. And as I say, these are, are walk-up targets which are drilled ready once the exploration licence is granted. Uh, as I say, Gurnong South, I won't drill on, so I pointed out, but uh, just in uh, an oblique long section, this is the Swan Zone. This is the jewellery box of the Fosterville Mine. Uh, the Koori Zone is now the, the new uh, development. There's a, a decline here and cross there for, for mining, which is currently underway. And this is Gurnong South, now sitting in S2's ground. Uh, you can see just a few sporadic drill holes, which have intercepted gold and proved that plunge extent of mineralization is continuing within our block. Okay, I'll, I'll talk briefly on Northern Finland. So this is a, a really a frontier for Northern American explorers. Uh, I talked about the, the Akari discovery, the 4 million ounces down here. 
So on this map, we are the light blue. Uh, currently, we have, uh, we've completed a drilling program last year at our Arnavalkia prospect to the north. We also entered into a number of joint ventures last year. First of all, with Kinross Gold in the yellow perimetered blue blocks, uh, and also with Rupert Resources. Importantly, our uh, joint venture with Rupert sits on what's called the Circle Line, a major east-west structure. Uh, and this is the structure where their Ikari discovery has been made. So they really are the, the ideal joint venture partner for this block of ground, for these blocks of ground. Uh, we're at a strategic point in Finland determining whether we go ahead ourselves and continue exploration, whether we partner further. Um, we're exploring all options at present. Uh, our, so this is in Finland. So this is Arna Valky to the north. We believe we're on the brink of a, of a, a major uh, load gold discovery here. Uh, we've drilled roughly over 1.3 kilometres, but there's only 12 piercing intercepts at the target zone, which is beyond 200 metres depth. We've got a number of high grades. So what we like about this, we've got the scale, 1.3 kilometres, a very good background of gold running 0.3, but importantly, that propensity for high grade. So grades up to 30 grams per tonne. Uh, better intercepts include 6.8 metres at 11.8 uh, at grams per tonne or 20 metres going four grams per tonne. So this really has the makings of a significant system. And it sits roughly uh, 20 kilometres from the 7.8, uh, sorry, 7.4 million ounce Kittler mine. Um, just I'll point out there that Kittler is also managed by Agnico Eagle. So Agnico is the new owner of Fosterville Mine. So we are now neighbours on probably both of our projects on the flagship of that, uh, on the flagships of that $26 billion company. Okay. I'm probably going to get run short on time here. I've got two minutes to go. So I'm, I'm very quickly going to talk to projects we're working uh, this calendar year. So the Polar Bear project, we have the nickel rights. Um, this was uh, a divestment of the tenure by S2 to West Gold, uh, now owned by Corora. Uh, this is a live nickel system. So we, have, we own the nickel rights here. Um, we have three known nickel sulfide occurrences, um, which is quite rare in this, in this environment. You know, we've got a deposit with no nickel, uh, no nickel, no nickel occurrences. Yet we haven't explored it for some time. This could be a flagship in a, in any junior portfolio. We're heading back in there um, for the first time. We're doing deep penetrating EM. Uh, we'll also be doing air core RC and diamond drilling. Hopefully in the course of the first half of this calendar year. So this is one I'm particularly excited about to be uh, to be getting back to, particularly with a, a tailwind of of a high nickel prices. Uh, just to flag here that uh, there has been some work done, but there's only one kilometre out of 10 kilometres of prospective ultramafic stratigraphy, which has been tested. Most of the EM performed to date has been ineffectual in Salt Lake environment. Um, and we're looking to get improved that with new deep penetrating, uh, well, not new, but uh, technology that hasn't been available, but uh, deep penetrating low temperature squid is the most likely source we'll use. Okay. I'll just finish off on our Western Yulgarn project. So, uh, just pointing out, Julie Mar is to the south. We've got a number of exposure to tenure along the Darling Fault region, the Western Yulgarn. Obviously, we're looking for intrusive magmatic nickel copper PGE mineralization. Uh, we've got exposure in our own right in our three springs and West Murchison projects, but also through our roughly 13.5% holding in Todd River resources highlighted in orange on this, uh, on this slide here. Uh, so at present, we are undertaking EM at three springs. Uh, we'll soon complete an EM program at West Murchison, as well as uh, RC drilling at West Murchison over some uh, pretty attractive uh, geochemical nickel, copper, gold, PGE anomalies uh, on a number of targets within West Murchison. I'll leave it there. Um, thanks very much, Jerry. Uh, look, we've got a, a lot going on. We've got a team with, uh, who've made multiple discoveries. We've got the cash to do it, and we've got some great ground. We've got a, a number of shots on goal. Um, through, this, through this year with a number of projects active, including some I haven't mentioned. Uh, I really look forward to this year and uh, love to have some uh, new shareholders on board. Thank, thank you very much. Thank everyone. you, Matthew. <clears throat> Kane Fulgerty is a geologist with 20 years of experience in mining, predominantly in near mine reserve growth, greenfields exploration and acquisitions. He's worked in Australia, Africa, and China, and he's currently GM, Geology and Business Development, with Waluna Mining Corporation. Uh, Kane, welcome along. Uh, good afternoon. 
I'll be talking about the large scale exploration targets that we're drilling around Waluna during the next six months. And also about the solid progress we've made on the sulfide redevelopment at Waluna since the last RIU. This is our brand new sulfide concentrator for stage one, which was commissioned in December. It's spitting out about 50 bags of concentrate every day, grading over 70 grams for sale to our uh, off-tape partners, Polymetal and Trafigura. So we're transforming Waluna from 50,000 ounces of production from free milling sources last year to 120,000 ounces per annum when it's fully ramped up by the middle of this year. And we plan in stage two to double production again to over 200,000 ounces per annum from 2024. So Waluna's got a long and checkered history of production uh, over 125 years, but Waluna's best years are still ahead of it. The stage one concentrator is already operating above nameplate. And during the next few months, we'll be ramping up the underground mine to hit that run rate and also building and commissioning the tailings retreatment plant, which adds about 20,000 ounces of that total at good margins. And next month, we'll publish updated reserves and a feasibility study for stage two, which we expect will show a pathway to double production to over 200,000 ounces, which will place Waluna among the top 10 Australian gold mines. And we've got fantastic exploration upside. During the next six months, we're testing nine large scale targets around the Waluna mine. So stage one is well advanced uh, and stage two subject to the feasibility study. Uh, we, we, we see that uh, doubling production to over 200,000 ounces per annum. And to do that, we simply build a carbon copy of the stage one concentrator right next door. And we uh, build a new crushing and grinding front end to meet the expanded output from the underground mine, which means that the existing crushing and grinding and the existing CIP circuit uh, is available again to also process free milling ore, which can add another 80,000 ounces of production on top of the 200,000 ounces of sulfides production in stage two. And in the long term, we envisage a pressure oxidation plant built on site at Waluna, um, which will further lower operating costs and add scale. Waluna is located right at the northern tip of the Norseman Waluna Greenstone Belt, which is the biggest gold belt in WA, which also hosts Kalgoorlie. And we've got 1,600 square kilometres of this blue chip real estate. It's a fantastic piece of ground to go and explore in. Some happy snaps of the first bags of con. Uh, we've invested $188 million in the last 18 months in the sulphide concentrator in redeveloping the underground mine. And we've invested $26 million just in exploration in the last financial year, which will continue over the long term to really do justice to an ore body of this scale. And the bottom right pick there is a polymetals pressure vessel, which they're installing um, and will come online in 2024 to coincide with our stage two expansion. Um, Polymetal identified Waluna as the best project globally to provide significant volumes of concentrate to feed their uh, pressure oxidation plants. Moving on to the geology and exploration, in the last two years we've been busy. We've drilled 178,000 metres at Waluna, which is a massive drill out by any standard. The resource is now four and a half million ounces. And we increased the measured and indicated portion of the resource last year uh, by a further 20%, which supports the reserves update and the feasibility study that's coming out next month. In addition to Waluna, we've got the other important mining centres of Lake Way, uh, Matilda and Galaxy, and the regional gold exploration. Uh, and, and on top of that, we have um, historical high grade nickel discovery, which is just begging for, for more drilling and grassroots lithium exploration kicking off as well. But I, I won't have time to talk about those today. The resource update, um, 
at Waluna, the measured and indicated portion is now 60%. And together with the other mining centres and the significant tailings resource, which is available for retreatment, we've got over five and a half million ounces. There's a lot of high grade gold at Waluna. If uh, the underground resource is quoted above three and a, uh, 2.3 grams, but if you use a three and a half gram cutoff, there's still over 3 million ounces at 5.8. And if you select a higher cutoff, there's over 2 million ounces at over seven grams. It's a lot of high grade gold. We've consistently published high grade and thick intercepts as we've infill drilled the inferred areas around the Waluna mine over the last two years. And it's amazing what's been left behind. We've been drilling uh, the high grade sulfide chutes underneath the open pits and close to the uh, pre uh, underground um, access um, to lower the cost per ounce developed. Now the focus is shifted more to exploration around the Waluna mine. So we're testing nine large scale targets uh, in the upper 600 metres and down to 1500 metres. And we're targeting high grade and large shoots similar to the other ones we know about. Um, Bulletin, for example, is one and a half million ounces at seven grams. That's the current resource plus past production. The East Load Endowment was two million ounces at five grams and West Load is one and a half million ounces at, at six grams. So if any one of these nine targets come in, that's going to move, move the dial for us. Luna is a giant gold system. The gold endowment is 15,000 ounces per vertical meter. And there's a close correlation with the amount of drilling uh, and that gold endowment. So um, we expect that as we continue to infill drill and drill a long strike and at depth, we're going to continue to grow that uh, endowment. For example, the east and west loads on the right hand side, um, there's a three and a half million ounce endowment in the upper 700 metres. And the seismic survey that we completed last year shows that the gold structures just keep on going and the resource is open at depth and we'll be drilling the deepest holes ever at Waluna, hoping for a repeat of the three and a half million ounces in the next 700 metres. Uh, the seismic survey that we completed last year, uh, 2D seismic lines, this is a, a, a rough interp. Uh, it showed three things, that the seismic method works. So we're going to move to a full 3D survey over the whole mine site to define drilling targets. And it showed that the gold structures just keep on going at depth. So the 10 million ounces of Waluna is in the small white box on the left. And we identified an intriguing set of structures which are conveniently located underneath the processing plant and the tailings dams in the camp where there's only been some shallow sterilization drilling in the past. So to drill the deeper parts of the east and west loads, we have to sit the rig so far over to the east and we're actually gonna be drilling around the, the process plant site to get deep enough that we're gonna test some of these structures on the way down. Stepping out in scale again, Regent is a similar style of deposit, um, same style of mineralization. And the Waluna deposit uh, in the top, top box there, it's hosted along the north south faults. And you can see the offsets in the AeroMag image. And there's a similar set of north south faults and structural complexity in the Regent area. But the whole area is concealed under calcrete cover, which has prevented exploration in the past. So, uh, it's open in all directions along strike. There's some really sweet intercepts in the sulfides and, uh, and we're gonna be scoping that out with further drilling. It's got the potential to be a very large system like, like Waluna. So in summary, we've got a very large and high grade uh, gold resource, which is growing. And uh, we have a very straightforward staged plan to double production by the middle of this year and to double it again over the medium term. And the success that we've had with drilling over the last two years and with executing the stage one plan gives us confidence that Waluna is gonna be one of the top 10 uh, gold mines uh, in Australia. Thank you.
Neometals innovatively develops opportunities in minerals and advanced materials essential for a sustainable future. Their core projects are lithium iron battery recycling, vanadium recovery, uh, Eli lithium and Barambi titanium and vanadium project, the latter being one of the world's highest grade hard rock titanium vanadium deposits. Here to present Neometal story is Jeremy McManus, General Manager of Investor Relations and Commercial. Jeremy. Jerry, thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Each year we come to the RIU conference, we progressively reduce our reliance on upstream minerals. And so what I'm going to do today is talk to you about our flagship project. And that project's a little bit different probably from some of the other resource stories that you've heard today. So essentially our job with that project is, is not to recover minerals and, and explore and go mining, but rather to recover materials, which we're feeding back into the battery supply chain to make you know, the next generation of cells. So it's a very circular opportunity. So a helicopter view of our business, Neometals is an innovative project development company. And I say that for the fact that it's not a traditional mining company anymore. It once was, it is no longer. We've got a, a very diversified and vertically integrated suite of projects. Uh, all of those projects support decarbonisation, uh, sustainability, and helping uh, reduce climate change. But the, the commonality with all those projects is they all intersect the EV and the battery supply chain. So by way of background, Neometals has a strong balance sheet. This has come about through the fact that with partners, we developed the Mount Marion lithium mine. We had good execution success there, bolstered up the coppers, returned a lot of money back to shareholders. But importantly, it left us with a war chest to pursue these growth projects. Um, and one in particular I'm going to talk about today. So this is the raft of, of projects, um, you know, essentially, they are all partnered. They're all being co-funded through two investment decisions. Three of those decisions are happening this financial year and one in 2023. So moving left to right, lithium battery recycling, I'll talk more about that, but that's essentially a technology which we've advanced. Uh, we're progressing that towards commercialization in Germany. Vanadium recovery, uh, that likewise is a technology that Neometals has developed. We've partnered. Uh, it's based on extracting vanadium out of steel waste in Scandinavia. I'll jump to the Barambi project. That's our last upstream minerals project. It has a development decision tail end of this year. It's had a lot of money, 35 million plus spent on it by ourselves. Uh, it is permitted. It's, it's all but mine ready. It needs an offtake. And lastly, slightly longer term is the Eli Lithium Project. And that, again, is a technology which we've developed. We've got partners in Portugal who are piloting that technology at larger scale. And it's all about producing lithium chemicals from salts as an intermediate source. And it's more environmentally friendly and cost advantageous. So a footprint for us globally, you can see in blue there in the background, you know, there are various different projects around the world. There's a confluence of projects in Europe. And in the right-hand side, you've got a bit of a funky Venn diagram. I think the takeaway there is the minerals in green are the ones you want. They support, uh, they're critical minerals that support, um, you know, this new mega trend. And of those six minerals, we speak for all of them with the exception of rare earths. In terms of the team, I mean, the company's got some form in executing. We have a strong team with a track record. And probably what I'd leave you with there is, as a case example, that Mount Marion project sort of epitomizes the strategy and, and the way we develop our projects. And that is try and get in early, put, put foot on assets, spend money ourselves with the drill bit or in the lab, and then bring in big partners. And that allows us to scale up quickly and de-risk those projects and look to return money to shareholders, which we've done over the last five years, about $82 million. So I, I need to touch on this for the fact that, um, you know, it's not marketing lexicons for near metals with regards ESG. 
we produce products that go into green applications for sure. But before we do that, you know, the vast majority of our projects involve site remediation, uh, recycling, recovery, and sequestering CO2. So we've got strong conviction on this. Uh, we're into year three of our ESG sustainability reporting, and uh, you know, we're making a lot of commitments in that. So it's the real deal. In terms of the dashboard, I won't labor it, but you know, the green line is going in the right direction. That's good. We've got about $75 million in cash, no debt. And if you include short-term or liquid investments, it's about $120 million on the balance sheet with about 14,000 or 13,500 shareholders. Speaking of which, we've got the a London listing coming up, an AIM listing at the end of February. So aside from the domestic institutions, which are starting to come onto our register, we're hoping we'll have a lot more European investors shortly. As a backdrop, uh, the inconvenient truth about electric cars is that the green one, as opposed to the interceptor in black, the green one's not as green as it appears. All those eclectic minerals that go into those batteries have a very heavy CO2 footprint. And so after the manufacturing phase, those vehicles only claw back that footprint during the use phase. So one of the best ways to do that and support large vehicle OEMs is to recycle their batteries. Uh, and look, where you want to be with um, critical minerals is on the far left here. This was done by the World Bank. It's just summarising some of the key minerals that we need. The interesting thing is of the top six, you know, I think near metal speaks for five. And in one project alone, you know, we've got five of those critical minerals. And that project is our battery, lithium battery recycling project. It's been a five-year labour of love in development. Uh, we've partnered up with a very big German EPC engineering group, and we've formed a JV called Primobius. And so to take a step backwards, you know, why do you even need to recycle the batteries? The issue at hand is there's about to be mountains of them. The real inflection point looks like 2026. But you can't uh, put them in landfill. One, because you're not allowed, but moreover, they have hazardous ingredients. They tend to catch on fire. They do the same thing when they're transported, um, but they're valuable. So they're valuable because of the value of the constituents in a dollar sense, but also from a strategic supply chain resilience sense. And what you're looking at on the right-hand side is the opportunity. And I think that graph summarizes it. it. What you're looking at is huge volumes from 2026 of both production scrap from cell manufacturing and then end of life volumes. And someone's got to do something about these. And so there are tremendous tailwinds supporting that business for us. You've got regulations, stakeholders who insist. Um, and as a result, it's an unstoppable force now. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of companies trying to figure out what they're going to do about recycling. And there's not too many companies in a position with industrial scale that can actually support, at least in the short term. So what we're doing in partnership with the SMS group in the Primobius joint venture is five years of process development started off with a focus on consumer electronics. We've broadened that to include uh, NMC batteries from vehicles and, and NCA. And we did that just because of the sheer volumes that have come on in the last five years. And the way it works loosely, it's a two-stage process. You can take any format of cells. Um, we don't intend to collect those. We intend to work with OEMs and get them from the farm gate, if you like. Stage one, you smash the batteries, you shred them you beneficiate the ingredients and you separate out the plastic and the steel and the, and the foils that come with it and you recycle them. Then you're left with an intermediate black mass, they call it, and that goes off either to a co-located refinery or elsewhere to a hub somewhere else. That's the expensive kit where a lot of the intellectual property resides. And here we're using hydrometallurgy, which is the sunrise industry as distinct from pyrometallurgy, which is very much a sunset industry. And we're pulling out all the valuable ingredients, nickel, copper, lithium, cobalt, et cetera. So this is a very sustainable process. And on the left-hand side, you're looking at some images of our demonstration facility in a place called Hilkenbach, Germany. Uh, it belongs to SMS. This is their 
Global Competence Centre, and we've occupied a couple of warehouses uh, you can see in the top image. So the way you make money out of this, the business model, uh, essentially everything goes through Promobius. You know, our global commercial rollout is through that joint venture. We're targeting industrial volumes and trying to target OEMs directly, hence why we've partnered up fairly early with a very big partner in SMS. That's a 150-year-old private German EPC company that's very well regarded in Europe. And look, there's huge margins in producing the, the graph here with the green bars. That shows you the different type of chemistries. There's really good margins in consumer electronics. That's the one on the far left to your eyes. And on the far right is you know, where the battery chemistry will be out of vehicles in a few years time. The red checkered line is our uh, operating costs. So you can see a fair margin. The way we intend to insul you know, insulate that margin is by having a flexible business model. And to be honest, this is probably more critical than the technology in a way. So you can make money by providing a service for a fee. We see the bulk of our opportunity being to partner with OEMs. They have the feed. We don't have a resource under the ground, so we need to secure that feed. And they have a problem and they need a circular loop where they get the chemicals back and they can appease their stakeholders. And that's a very good way to protect margins. And in special circumstances, we would also consider licensing. This is a bit of a prelude to tell you where we're at. And, and the status of where we're at is there's a mountain of batteries coming by virtue of car manufacturing and cell manufacturing happening in North America and Europe. We've dovetailed what we're doing in alignment with that. The first thing that we will commercialize is a 10 ton per day shredder in Germany. It's part of our demo plant. We've modified it, we've commissioned it. It's waiting on a permit, which is imminent. So that's ready to go. And through those demo trials, we're collecting data for our feasibility study. There's, a, there's an inflection point there in July where we decide um, how to roll this out on a 50 tonne per day basis. And one of the ways to do that is with a partner called Stelco in, in Canada. They're a steel recycler. They're also wanting to offer a full solution to car makers uh, by recycling the batteries as well. And we have an MOU with Itoshu out of Japan to likewise joint venture with them. So where we are, you know, we've done our trials, at least for the, the shredding and the smashing plant that I showed you pictures of. That's been commissioned. You know, we're ready to put that into good use. The studies uh, that you can see in Feb and March will be collect, completed, culminating in a feasibility study in June and an investment decision in July. So that, that timing's good with the bell. That leaves us with the investment case. It's a huge opportunity for battery recycling. We're in the midst with a scale solution with big partners. Uh, and I'll leave you with the highlights for Near Metals, essentially an innovative company doing slightly different things in the resource space, you know, extracting materials, but not through mining. So thank you very much. Alto Metals is advancing the historic sandstone gold project located in the East Murchison of Western Australia. To tell us the Alto story, we please welcome Matt, Matthew Bowles, Managing Director. Welcome along, Matthew. Thanks, Jerry. It's uh, great to be here. And um, yeah, it's great to be um, here this afternoon at the um, RIU conference. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Alto Metals. Uh, we've had a fantastic year last year. We, um, we, we drilled about 60,000 metres of drilling. Um, we have had some delays in getting some of those assays through, but um, we announced the last ones um, uh, earlier this week. Um, and basically our plans um, for next year, so it's really just building on the great success that we've had in that exploration, and, and we hope that that's going to drive further growth and, uh, and lead to further new discoveries. So for those of you that don't know, Sandstone... Um, it's in the East Murchison of WA, um, so we're West Australian Gold Explorer. The Sandstone Gold Project covers over 900 square kilometres of the Grand Sandstone Greenstone Belt, so it's a dominant position um, over that um, Greenstone Belt. We're, um, we're surrounded by a number of, sort of multi-million ounce deposits um, and producing mines, so strategically it's a fantastic place to be. Our resource currently sits at 331,000 ounces. Those resources are open, um, they're open down dip, down plunge, along strike. Um, 
there's a number of high grade intercepts that we've recently announced that are outside that resource and we can see that resource growing considerably. Um, we've got some fantastic um, metal, uh, metallurgical recoveries. We uh, undertook some preliminary studies um, across both oxide, transitional and fresh um, and getting up to 90%, 98% recoveries in that, in that um, primary zone. So that's really encouraging for us. It sort of demonstrates that mineralisation um, can be liberated through a very simple CIL process and to date, no, no refractory issues or, or whatever, which is great. Um, and the unique thing about sandstone, and, and I'll show you a slide on this um, shortly, is um, the historical focus has really been on um, near surface oxide mineralization. So it hasn't had a lot of drilling um, below 100 metres depth, which is pretty amazing for a, a greenstone belt in Western Australia. And, and that to us is one of the key um, opportunities that we see at sandstone. We're well funded. We've got just over $6 million in the bank. We closed the capital raising last year. Um, so that's really going to lead into enable us to, to, to kick off our, our major drill program this year. And I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. That's going to start in the next couple of weeks. And, um, and we've got a resource update that um, is coming out this quarter. So that's really exciting as well to see that. So I just wanted to, to before I go into the rest of the presentation, just to walk through some of these um, uh, exploration highlights that, that, we, that we've had. And so the image down on the, the, the bottom is, um, so you're looking at the, we're focusing on the Lords Nelson's corridor. It's a three kilometre long corridor. Um, you'll see there in the bottom left-hand side, it's the Lord Nelson pit. That's a, it's an oxide pit. It's mined down to 90 metres. It's about 500 metres long. And you can see the mineralisation um, continues down plunge to the south. If you look further down that corridor in the top right-hand corner is, is another oxide um, small oxide pit, um, which is mined down to 40 metres, called Lord Henry. Um, most of the drilling in that area that we've done has identified that that mineralisation continues um, not only a long strike, down plunge, um, we've also stepped out and drilled below the pit. Um, both of these pits, as I said, it was basically were mined down to the oxide. As soon as they hit the fresh rock, stopped mining because the, uh, the mill that was there at the time couldn't take fresh material. Um, and so that there is the, is the opportunity for us. So it's really exciting that we've actually extended that mineralisation over a kilometre now. And uh, we had the new discovery um, at, uh, at Juno, uh, which was announced at the end of last year. And then just prior to that, um, uh, the Orion load. So it's really just demonstrated there's a, a lot more there. And you can look at some of the, um, the drilling results we've had, um, some very thick wide intercepts, certainly from, from Lord Nelson, that's, um, that's really encouraging to us. And I think we'll hopefully convert through to um, additional ounces. So very quickly on the corporate side, so um, we've got 528 million shares on issue, share price is about 8.4, so market cap of 44. Um, so quite a, quite a modest market cap for where we sit. But the key thing I'd like to point out for this slide um, is, is we've got a very tightly held capital structure. So our, our top 20 hold about 70%, and a lot of that's really controlled between that sort of top five, top six shareholders. So as I mentioned, we're in a world-class um, gold district. You can see there that we're surrounded by a number of operating mills um, and some multi-million ounce deposits. Uh, the infrastructure is fantastic. There's commercial flights out to Mount Magnet. You can fly um, charter flights out to the airstrip at Sandstone. Um, the whole area is serviced by um, sealed roads. There's grid power, there's water. Um, so you've got all the right ingredients and strategically that's why we, we, we love this area. So this is probably one of my, my favourite slides. And if you think about sandstone itself, it's had mining activity since the, uh, the early 1900s. It's, um, it's already produced over a million ounces of gold from our properties. Um, Hacks and Arroyo, two high-grade reefs, they both produced over 200,000 ounces at 24 and 16 grams per tonne, respectively. Uh, and then more recently, um, uh, Bull China, Lord Nelson, Lord Henry, three open pit oxide um, mines and, and at the time they were mined by Troy and they were some of the most profitable mines in Australia. So part of our challenge has been um, when we have such a large dominant um, land position is, is, is how we prioritise those targets and where, where do we focus. And for us, it's, um, it's really focusing on um, our existing resources and most of those are located down in the southeast corner there, um, an area that we're now calling the, the Alpha Domain. Um, and really our strategy which has been really successful to date, has just been sort of following those resources up. So we've been stepping out and um, we're, we're drilling a long strike and, and below those resources and the same as below those pits and we're finding a lot more gold. So it's, it's certainly something that's, um, as, as a strategy, it's working. It's something that we're gonna to continue to do for 2022. The, um, the, the part about this slide that I really wanna draw your attention to and where we see the, the, the big upside 
um, potential at sandstone is. So the image on the left hand side there, all of those red dots represents all the drilling that's ever been done over sandstone. And I guess if you looked at that, you would consider that um, it's 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 fairly done. So, um, you know, there's a quite a few explorers that had given it a good hard crack. Um, but if you look at the same image on the right hand side, it just shows all the drilling that's deeper than 100 metres. Um, so a lot of those holes just disappear. And I think that's amazing. So um, to have a, a greenstone belt in Western Australia that's really, really underexplored. And we see that as the, 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 um, the significant opportunity, given that these orogenic gold systems can go a lot deeper. So the Lord's Corridor, um, it's a large granodiorite intrusion. It's punched up between mafic and ultramafic rocks. Um, it hosts two, um, the, the two um, shallow high-grade oxide mines I mentioned before, Lord Nelson and Lord Henry. Um, most of the mineralisation we're seeing is on that, um, on that eastern side, on the contact between the granodiorite and the ultramafic is where we're seeing that very, very high-grade mineralisation, and then it's like dispersing through the granite itself. Most of that mineralisation, um, it's trending to the south. Um, we're undertaking a, a gravity survey on the entire corridor at the moment. The, the reason for that, it's going to map out um, that granodiorite, so it's going to certainly help with some deeper drilling that we're planning to do as we sort of um, follow that mineralisation down. So we've, as I said, extended that mineralisation from Lord Nelson to over a, over a kilometre now with a new Juno discovery, um, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, but for us, it's, a, it's really encouraging to sort of start seeing this type of mineralisation. We've also um, started drilling further down the corridor towards um, the centre part of the corridor. Um, we've got some encouraging results there. It certainly warrants some more, more follow-up. And if you continue south, you then end up at Lord, um, Lord Henry, which um, that's only mined down to 40 metres. It's a number of high-grade um, high stack loads. That mineralisation is open to the northeast and to the west, so we're going to um, continue following that up. And then if you follow the tail all the way, way around, um, the granodiorite pinches out and then you've got this um, up through to Havilah and Meningamali. Um, it's over two, two and a half kilometres of high-grade mineralisation that we've identified. Um, it's within um, the mafic and ultramafic rocks, but that's um, in, a, in a different type of mineralisation. It's a differentiated dolerite. Um, we had some results out from that a couple of weeks ago, um, and it's certainly something that we're going to um, continue to follow up in that Lord's area. So this is just looking at the Lord Nelson in a long section. You can see um, that... Um, a historical pit there, mine down to 90 metres. Um, I'll draw your attention to the, the dashed line that's below that. So the current resource there is 109,000 ounces. Um, and you, you can clearly see from um, that slide all of the mineralisation that's outside of that current resource. There's some very thick sort of 49 metre wide intercepts um, outside that resource. And we can see that sort of continuing to grow um, with the update that's coming out um, later this quarter. Um, quite exciting for us is um, the Juno load, which is only announced quite recently. We're looking at drilling up dip and down dip of that and uh, looking to extend that mineralisation further to the south. I also just wanted to step back. So when we first got involved with, with, with Alto, it was really focusing on, on that Lord's Corridor and, and building a story around the Lord's and, and demonstrating there's a lot more mineralisation to be found. And, and I think we've successfully done that. And what we're looking at doing now is, is sort of focusing on that alpha domain. And um, what you're looking at here, this is soils over magnetics, and you can see the mag there. Um, it folds around at the basis between Lord Henry and Havilah, and then it runs up along a 20 kilometre long corridor, which hosts Havilah, Vanguard and Indomitable. So that's, that's a much larger 20k trend. Vanguard's um, got 50,000 ounces at the moment, it's unmined. Um, there's a 40 metre oxide component there, and then goes down into fresh rock, Indomitable, 70,000 ounces, intriguing area, Indomitable. Um, there's over 190 metres, um, very deeply weathered zone. So it's still an oxide at 100 metres, metres down. So that's quite interesting for us. We're looking at following that up. We, um, we hit Vanguard pretty hard last year. We've extended the strike um, uh, northwest, southeast by over two and a half Ks. Um, as I said, that resource is 50,000 ounces and we can see that growing considerably. And so that's quite exciting. And I um, just, this is my last slide. I think the whole message from the presentation is, is that we're really about driving growth. We, um, we drilled 60,000 metres last year, um, including our maiden diamond, pro um, diamond program at the Lords and Vanguard Undomitable. Um, we had some fantastic drilling results and we're just looking to maintain that momentum this year. Um, we've got, as I said, the resource updates coming out this quarter. We're doing IP and gravity. So the gravity is over the Lords corridor, IP is over Vanguard. Um, we've got a rig arriving in a couple of weeks. Um, it's going to start following up at Juno. That'll be drilling some um, deeper holes um, around 
uh, further to the south along the corridor. Um, and then also there's a couple of areas that we need to, 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 to infill, I'm sorry, not infill, to, to confirm at, um, at Lord Nelson, um, which are currently outside that resource. Um, and then we're looking at getting a second rig in um, later on this year. And, and really it's about um, hitting this hard. We, as I said, we drew 60,000 metres this year. And I think this year we'd like to, like to, um, to better that. And we're certainly funded to, to achieve the majority of that. So lots of news flow going on um, for the whole year. Perfect. Um, I'm around for the rest of the day, tomorrow, all day tomorrow and, um, and Thursday. So any questions, please come see me in the booth. Thank you. Great. Now our final, that almost got off the ground. Um, our final presentation for today is with Charger Metals. It listed a mere six months ago and has successfully been generating drilling targets at its mat battery metal focus projects in Western Australia and the NT. Charger's managing director, David Crook, will run through two projects that have been readied for drilling. David, over to you. Thank you very much. And it's good to see some people uh, stay, well, the very resolute of you are still here. Uh, now it's interesting listening to the Neo Metals presentation because the genesis of Charger uh, is, is sort of a, a similar kind of thing. Uh, we were working with Lithium Australia and Lithium Australia had the same strategy of um, upstreaming uh, battery waste and things like that. Lithium Australia had been one of the first movers in the lithium exploration uh, space and had uh, aggregated a very compelling set of uh, exploration tenements. And so at Diggers and Dealers last year, a couple of us got together and thought, well, really, if Lithium Australia want to move into the battery recycling and, and other parts of that business, let's have a crack at their tenements. So we acquired the tenements we listed in July last year. And as some of the other explorers have said to you, a lot of exploration is just following a system. And uh, we, we've got these projects and we've been working to a system. So <clears throat> let's start with uh, the Coates project, which is just outside of Perth here. In the 1980s, uh, it was a, there was a very short-lived vanadium mine out there. So we know that there's a mafic uh, intrusion out there. Uh, and on another iteration of exploration out there, uh, an aluminium company came through and did quite a lot of geochemistry. We had the benefit of that. And uh, we, were acquired, we acquired it from uh, both Adrian Griffin personally and Lithium Australia generally. And uh, we've got stuck in there. So using uh, the, just the system, you've got geochemistry, a bit of mapping. Uh, we flow uh, a helicopter survey there and we've got a howling uh, V10 conductor, exactly where you'd want it to be. And I'll show you another summary uh, thing in the middle. So the stars are aligning in this and we're heading towards our first drilling project. So looking at this in a little more, more detail, that's copper geochemistry on the edge of the Mafic intrusion. This is the VTEM uh, conductor. We're in the process of doing a fixed loop EM survey over this now, but already that's where our conductor sits, eminently drillable. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a very binary result, I think, there. And amongst our neighbours there, we've heard other people talk about leverage. If you want leverage, our market capitalisation at the moment is about uh, $40 million. Uh, Chalice, three billion. Caspin had a huge run the other day when they hit some sulphides out there. Uh, and there are other people, of course, in our area, all with much, much higher market capitalisation. So this is a, a leverage play like you really see. Our second one, also sort of falls into that category. Charger has the central area here. Now this area was explored for uh, tantalum. It's known to have LCT pigmatites in the area. This whole belt through here is studded with LCT pigmatites. The gray area all around us is core lithium's finis project. They've got about 15 million tons of spodumene up in that area there. Well, they're constructing at the moment. And uh, we're just outside of Darwin, of course, so the infrastructure benefit is excellent in this area. Again, just working through the process, we had some geochemistry there. We've uh, uh, conducted our own geochemistry right through the whole project. Uh, this is lithium. Uh, we've got 
awesome targets here, here, and here. But this one here is over one and a half kilometers long. So for, for a pegmatite, that's pretty good. This whole zone through here is over eight kilometers long. And so it's stacked pegmatites, uh, strong lithium signatures. Up in this part of the world, if there's any lithium minerals around, they're usually gone. So the best you can hope for is um, short strike length halos around where the lithiums come from. So our process here is pretty complete now. We're going through our permitting process. Obviously, it's wet this time of year up there and there's uh, tall cane grass. So there's not much we can do for the next couple of months. But our intention is to be drilling there very early next year. Oh, sorry, this year. In the meantime, we did do that geochemistry. We also flew Aramag. You can see the trend of the country is like this. And I'll draw your attention to the Ahoy prospect up here. By the way, that's one of our geologists and what the pegmatites look like up there. Ahoy was drilled and CORE uh, announced its results quite recently. And these are, are very good results by any uh, measure. And so that's just off our tenement. We know that the fabric of the country is through here and we know that we've got a one and a half kilometre long pegmatite with a howling lithium anomaly just sitting right there. So we're really looking forward to drilling seven up in particular for megabucks. Uh, we think that that's an excellent name. That's not our name, it's a previous name uh, for a good place to find some lithium. Uh, just finishing off with our third project, we've got a large land holding out at Lake Johnson, which is halfway to Kalgoorlie. Uh, I suppose from a proximity point of view, uh, the West Farmers, uh, Kidman Resources, Earl Grey is uh, to the west of us. Top to bottom, 50 kilometres of strike. Down this end, uh, Lithium Australia discovered spodumene, so it is a spodumene field. We've completed uh, 6,000 soil samples up there. We are uh, go through the process of XR, XRFing them first of all before they go to the lab, but they're ready to go to the lab now. We've already discovered a lithium anomaly and new pegmatite here. There's a big LCT pegmatite field in this area here. So it's got all of the hallmarks of the things that you want to see and plenty of scale being 50 kilometres long. So I suppose wrapping up Charger, we listed six months ago. Uh, we firmly believe in just first principles kinds of exploration, soil geochemistry where it's needed, aeromagnetics for a proxy for geology where you can't see it, be in good areas. Uh, Lithium Australia had filtered the ground quite well before we acquired it. Uh, and topical uh, commodities, of course. So we believe the Coates is very much a jewel look lookalike. It's got uh, the copper and the nickel and the platinum group elements sitting coincident to a EM conductor that's just waiting to be drilled. The Bino project is a known spodumene area. It's a long strike from known spodumene occurrences, and it's sitting as an excision within CORE's project. CORE, by the way, is also a billion dollar company. And Lake Johnson gives us uh, a great place to, to spread our wings and, and make a decent discovery as well. So leverage, billion dollar neighbours, we're well credentialed, we know what we're doing, and uh, that's Charger. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Now, it has been a fantastic day, and what better way to finish it off than with a poolside drink. For the last few years, the opener has been sponsored by Ingenium, but the business has announced it was joining Stantec early last year. So this year, we are delighted to have Stantec on board as our sponsor. Now, who are Stantec? They're designers, engineers, scientists, and project managers innovating together. The Stantec community unites more than 25,000 employees in over 400 locations across six continents. Globally, Stantec has over 1,100 employees dedicated to providing engineering and environmental services across all phases of the mining life cycle. In addition to metallurgical test work, process design, and scoping and feasibility studies, Stantec offers environmental services, mine approvals, and community engagement in initiatives for greenfield mine development. To find out more about Stantec, visit Booth 24 or chat to them poolside with a drink because they're happy to buy you a drink. And in the meantime, we will see you tomorrow for day two. We'll be kicking off at 8.30. See you then. <laughs>